Welcome to NCBA's Cattleman's Call podcast with host Lane Nordland. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Cattleman's Call. Lane Nordland, happy to be with you here today. I don't know about you, but I have been busy trying to get hay put up, and all those meteorologists out there keep saying that it was supposed to be dry. Well, now we have thunderstorms every day, and what does a broke rancher have to do but host a podcast? And that's what I'm doing here today, but it's an exciting conversation here in the Cattleman's Call conversation today as as we're going to talk about uh, collaborations out in the countryside and the important work that we, we do not only in the beef and cattle business, but also in the corn and grain end of things as well. So we do want to big, give a big shout out to our collaboration to, today with the National Corn Growers Association for helping bring you this conversation wherever you are enjoying this podcast. And uh, without more, I will introduce our outstanding lineup of guests joining us here today from Colorado. Troy Schneider is joining us with the National Corn Growers Association. He's actually the corn liaison to the National Cattlemen's Beef Association. I love that title. Troy, uh, corn liaison. I, I I hope I have something cool like that uh, down the road uh, with a title like that, other than broke rancher and podcast host. <laughs> and uh, next we have Ellen Zimmerman with the U.S. Grains Council joining us from our nation's capital and a, a voice and face familiar to so many uh, on the podcast and within NCBA uh, media, Miss Jacqueline Wilson from Nebraska with the Wilson Flying Diamond Ranch in Nebraska. Uh, Thank you so much for joining us here today. It is busy. It is summer. But uh, uh, Troy, I'll start with you. How are things in, in uh, Central Eastern Colorado there? Oh, they're good. We just started wheat harvest uh, this last week. Uh, we're looking at laying down second cutting hay and cows and calves look good right now. The corn looks good, um, but we could use a little bit more rain. Well, well, maybe I'll send this rain we're supposed to be getting so I can get this hay crop put up, and then I'll ask for it back. But how how was that wheat looking down there? Uh, the weekend before Father's Day, uh, so about the 8th of June, we received a pretty nasty hailstorm. So the wheat is it's spotty. I mean, there was going to be some very good wheat, but uh, a lot of it got taken out early. So, um, But that's just the nature of farming. Yes, it is. And Jacqueline, for yourself, I know busy, busy day on the operation. Uh, how, how are things there in Nebraska for you and your family? You know, I think the western part of the state's looking really good right now. I was I was up in the northwest corner yesterday, and I was just green the entire way, which is great. Um, there's, of course, a lot of flooding up on the northeast side of the state right now that's occurring and over onto the eastern side with the Missouri River. Um, there's been a lot of severe weather that's gone through this year, especially down through the southern part of the state. Um, I know there's been a lot of crop damage along the plains, but, I mean, the great part is, is, you know, it's it, it always... It always ebbs and flows, and I think anybody in agriculture can say, you know, it's it will happen sooner or later. But it's been a tough year for a lot of people. But the cattle are fat right now. The cow market's great, um, and so there's not a whole lot to complain about. Other than trying to get hay put up in my my neck of the woods, people are probably really shaking their head and saying, "Get this guy off the podcast. He's complaining about moisture." But uh, uh, maybe looking a, f- a little bit further east to our nation's capital, uh, Ellen uh, joins us uh, from Washington D.C. today. H- how are things out in the nation's capital here as we begin the month of July? Uh, hello, thank you for having me. Things in DC are are good, hot and steamy as it typically is uh, in the summer in DC. We're actually about 20 degrees cooler here today than we were over the weekend. So I'll, t- I'll take that break in the temperature for sure. As far as my crop update, my mint is taking over the garden um, <laughs> as it does uh, every year. So uh, that's pretty much all, all I have to report on my personal crop update, but love to hear uh, how things are going across the country and excited to dig into the conversation and talk more about uh, all the things we have to discuss today. Well, uh, you're making me want to mint julep right now. Maybe after I get this hay put up, I'll celebrate and, and, and watch a, I have a mint julep. But uh, obviously, I want to thank you three for, for joining us here today. And as I mentioned at the beginning of our conversation, collaboration. Uh, collaboration is key in agriculture. And especially, there's so many different factors out there that impact success of cattle producers, the beef sector. And, and of course, uh, that, that includes feed. That includes uh, uh, trade negotiations, not only in North America, but across the world. So I, I'm really excited about uh, talking about collaboration here today. And uh, 
for our listeners that are joining us that maybe uh, are, are unfamiliar with these collaborations or with our guests, Jacqueline, I, I, I want to start with you. Could, could you just share a, a little more about your background, your work uh, uh, there in Nebraska uh, with NCBA, with the U.S. Meat Export Federation, and maybe just a, a quick a bit about your family operation in Nebraska? Sure, Lane. So fifth generation cow-calf producer from Lakeside, Nebraska, um, along with Wilson Flying Diamond Ranch. We also own Flying Diamond Beef, which is a direct-to-consumer beef business where we ship beef all over the U.S. I uh, started getting involved in NCBA, oh, been decade plus now, and currently serve as chair of international trade. Um, my, my term is up in July, so I'm going to have to move on, I guess, to something new and exciting. But um it's been a great, a great experience because along with that, I've been having the opportunity to travel quite a bit overseas, um, especially to speak in other countries about that collaboration, not only between in industries within the ag whole sector, but, but between like producers and politicians or producers and corporations. And so it's been really neat. Um, along with that, I'm also a 2024 Nuffield USA scholar. There's been 21 of us total from the U.S., so proud to represent that and that comes with a whole whole other huge travel itinerary for this upcoming year so that's kind of exciting to to be able to experience especially the beef industry overseas and to see what great things that we can do here in the U.S. to continue to prove our markets because that's one of the things that you know is at the foremost of those discussions is trade is huge and and we don't have we don't have a cap on trade in in terms of the sky's the limit and so the more that we have those opportunities, you know, to send our product overseas, um, the better it is for our industry as a whole. Well, thanks for that uh, that preview and to, to your daily life. Uh, you're, you're very busy, but do so much to advance uh, the, the, the business here uh, for producers back home. And, and Troy, for yourself, obviously I asked how the crops were doing there in Colorado, but uh, let's just talk more about your involvement uh, with the National Corn Growers Association, your work on the state level, but also that, uh, that corn liaison title, as I mentioned, uh, with, with NCBA as well. Well, Lane, uh, I've been involved with the Colorado Corn Administrative Committee, the checkoff, uh, now called the Colorado Corn Promotion Council since uh, 2013. Got active in U.S. Grains Council in about 2016 and uh, picked up my involvement with NCB, NCGA in uh, around 2020. And so that, that board liaison position um, at the beginning of the fiscal year, uh, President Woolley assigned all the board members different tasks to go out and do, and one of mine was to represent NCGA with NCBA. And with that, I had to ask President Woolley, I said, what does this mean? And he goes, build those relationships, open up the communication, continue doing what um, staff, Michael Granche, Sarah McKay have been doing. You know, we've overcome a lot of the hurdles in the past. Uh, you know, some of the things that uh, some of the challenges our two industries have faced over in the past, we've we've talked through that and we've built better relationships because of that. So I'll be joining you guys in San Diego next week and look forward to that. Well, thanks. Thanks for uh, a little more background on that. I, I truly appreciate that. And and uh, Ellen, from your perspective at the U.S. Grains Council, uh, talk more about your work uh, in D.C. And, and how that impacts not only the grain aspect of that, but also uh, impacts the livestock industry, particularly those cattle producers out in the countryside. Yeah, so uh, the U.S. Grains Council is an association of members in the U.S. So we represent corn, sorghum, and barley farmers, but also the agribusinesses that are along the export value chain of those commodities and, and any of the uh, co- and byproducts of those commodities as well. So ethanol, DDGs, corn gluten meal, uh, malt barley, anything uh, along those lines is, is the business that the council wants to, to be a part of. And like I said, those agribusiness members as well. And so that's the association piece. And then the cooperator piece means that we are we receive dollars from USDA in the Farm Bill and a couple of other programs like the Agricultural Trade Promotion Program, as well as the Regional Agriculture Promotion Program, ATP and RAP, um, to shorten uh, the the uh, uh, words a bit there uh, from USDA. And so we're a steward of those dollars as well. And that allows us to work around the world. Uh, we have full-time presence in 28 different countries 
ministries and programs in more than 60. And so we're really about uh, promoting trade in those uh, locations. And I like to say, move that grain. We don't care how, we don't care where. And that means we really support grains in all forms, which is where the collaboration with our uh, USMEF, USA Peak, and, and those livestock producers really comes into play. Because uh, if we're exporting those value products, um, it, it means a, a huge deal to our uh, producers in the countryside too. So when we really look at the impact that trade has on uh, of course, the, the cattle and beef industry, but also the, the grain sector. Uh, Jacqueline, I'll start with you. With, with all the work that you do and being a voice and, and meeting so many uh, buyers and consumers of our products across the globe, I, I guess, how do you interact with your producers back home when, when they ask you about uh, the impact and the importance of these export markets uh, for beef, and, and then uh, Troy can can chime in there as well. But uh, how important truly are these markets uh, to help uh, with prices here at home, and also trying to to keep up with that demand for high quality beef that consumers globally want? Well, I think I think one of the important discussions that I always try to share with producers back home is, of course, what what is the U.S. beef perception overseas? You know, I mean, it has changed uh, immensely just in the last 20 plus years of my travels, you know, whether I was there was a time, you know, I was in China over 10 years ago and, and hearing people talk about, you know, how they did not want U.S. beef in the country because U.S. beef was nothing but but unsafe and unhealthy. And, and now, you know, you start to see those shifts in trade, thanks in part to all the great work that, you know, some of the producers along with the U.S. Meat Export Federation has been doing to to open up those market spaces and, and to really promote a picture of what of what ranching looks like in the U.S. And I think that's the other perception, too, is, is you know, we have we have a tendency to say, well, U.S. is all factory farms, especially when we hear that from our international guests. And and I just pull out my phone and start scrolling through photos and they see really quick that this is not this is not what they have envisioned of the U.S. beef industry. And San, Nebraska Sandhills looks a little bit different than what they had envisioned. And, and so. You know, those conversations are important and, and it's not so much only having those conversations overseas, but having it back home and, and sharing with producers, okay, well, if you're not in favor of trade, what are we going to do with some of those cuts that we just don't eat here in the U.S.? You know, let's talk about our awful, awful, you know, and, and those things that I, I personally would not care to eat myself. And so let's ship them somewhere else where people, I mean, to them, it's a delicacy. And it increases value to our animal. And so those are all things that we have to share and we have to tell that story. And I know we get into discussions on imports and exports all the time. And I, I think our current administration can definitely do a better job of, of focusing on trade. But they've been really lax on that trade picture. But hopefully, you know, depending on what this election looks like, that's something that we can continue to have those discussions to open those trade borders and, and to get more U.S. product over, overseas and in turn continue to raise the value of our animals at home. And, and at the same time, obviously, we, we I think those of us in the cattle business, we don't think about the impact that our beef exports and beef sales have on the the farmer. And, and so, Troy, uh, let me, could you share some of those figures and just the economic impact that uh, that uh, that protein uh, exports have on, for U.S. farmers in that grain and specifically on corn as well? Well, I think back in 2022, if you look at the 22 marketing year, I think USMEF put a, a dollar figure together and we we're adding about a dollar per bushel when it comes to all protein being exported. And you asked the question earlier, how do we interact with our producers back home? You know, as a, as a cow calf operator right now, we're experiencing record markets and that's a great thing, but it comes at the price of there was, there was market, there was herd reduction. We wa we watched neighbors selling out uh, much like what we've seen in the, in the eighties in the farm crisis. So now you take it forward to last week, with the USDA report fighting another million acres of corn. Every time we turn around, we have to be ready to act, find every market we can because you're gonna find another million acres of corn. We don't wanna lose our neighbors due to a farm crisis or due to herd reduction. Um, we're all competitors. We all compete against each other for land, for other things, but 
I think like what Jacqueline's doing, other board members, committee members, what Ellen at U.S. Grains, what Dan and the guys over at USMEF are doing, we're trying to make sure everybody can be successful. And that's the main thing we're trying here. I think that's, add on to that, the best thing, I'm going to steal Ellen's, their motto, DEI, developing markets, enabling trade, improving lives. That's Grains Council's motto, and that's a great one. No, it is. And it, just to uh, put some numbers in front of our audience as well, you know, you referenced back in 2022 an added value of a dollar and a penny a bushel just on the uh, because of those exports. Uh, but you look at uh, the 2022 data for beef and pork exports that accounted for 503 million bushels of U.S. corn usage worth three point four billion dollars. And that, that helps support those corn producers by $6.75 per bushel on average. So, Troy, I mean, when we look at those uh, type of figures, um, when, when you're talking with your fellow farmers on the grain end of things, just the importance of exploring and trying to grow that trade globally, it's not just a beef issue. It's not just a grain issue. It, it's, an, it, it's an ag business opportunity that, that has to get, we have to continue to work on. Yep. In... The, the county to the south of me in Colorado here is Kit Carson County, the second largest employer in Kit Carson County, which is basically the size of Rhode Island, is 4M Feeders. 4M Feeders turns over, uh, I, don't, I don't remember exactly how many head per year, but they're the second largest employer in our county, our neighboring county. And in Colorado, our, to bring it back home to Colorado, our number one export of all products is beef. And it's up to Canada, uh, to our friends to the north. And that means jobs. And that puts people in schools. You know, everybody talks about Jacqueline and I were over in Europe in, I think, December of 2022 at the collaboration platform on ag. And people talk about coming from a small community, a small school. I graduated from a class of seven. I can, out, I can about outrule anybody. So when you talk about jobs, um, yeah, those are important. I mean, you, you take your corn into the feedlot there or up to the ethanol plant in Yuma and you see people putting going to work and those, whether it's domestically consumed or if it's exported, it's critical. Those are all jobs that we count on. Yep. Well, and obviously it's so important to have the data to back up your claims. And especially when you're going in front of decision makers, whether that's elected or appointed out in Washington, D.C., or when you're on trips uh, with buyers or respective governments. And uh, Ellen, uh, from from your view with the U.S. Grains Council, what are some of the studies that you have focused on that really uh, put a value on those grain exports as well? Yeah, we do a ton of studies to help with that data uh, on a lot of different fronts. But one that we just completed that I think really speaks to what Troy was just sharing is the, the value of trade is what we call it. And we update it every year. Um, and it's in partnership with the National Corn Growers Association. Uh, and it is just like I, the name of the study says it all. It's the value of trade uh, per state. And so I actually have Colorado pulled up here because that's where, 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 where Troy is from. Uh, but we can look at any of those states. And so uh, he was talking about his cow-calf operation. So $60 million is the value of corn um, exported in the equivalent of meat exported. So uh, when you look at all of those um, beef cattle exported from uh, Colorado, that's a lot of corn exported uh, too. So we know that Colorado is a corn deficit state, and that's because of all the beef cattle being exported. Uh, but, you know, all ships, uh, tide rises all ships. So, you know, that is uh, why we talk about grains in all forms. And the other great thing about this study is it also talks about the jobs. So 4,026 jobs were added to the state of Colorado because of that grain trade. And so I think that's a really valuable piece too. Um, and the reason that it is done in collaboration with the National Corn Growers Association is because, of course, this data is helpful for them when they talk about trade, but we also do it with the congressional districts. Um, and so as we're going into an election year, when we're talking about the Farm Bill, um, we can break it down by congressional district too. So 
when you're going into legislative offices, you could talk about how important trade is for a congressional office too. And, and those constituents can speak to um, the details of trade and how important that is. Uh, and so I, I shared just two figures, but we also have it broken down for DDGs, ethanol, sorghum, um, malt barley, barley, corn, and then total state economic output and um, gross product value too. So Ellen, if someone wants to look at that, how, how can they find that and, and use that to help educate themselves? Yeah, so it's on our website and it's very easily accessed. So it's under the very first tab, why trade matters. And then the value of grain exports map is how you navigate to it. And our website is grains.org. And it's available for all states, like I mentioned. Well, I, I just think of when producers are out in Washington, D.C., or even their state capitals. I mean, having a resource like that, mm -hmm. because you don't have a lot of time when you're meeting with a, a, a member of Congress or, or most likely their staff a lot of the time. And they need that information fast right there. Jacqueline, from your perspective, when, when you're stepping up to to defend and, and expand market access for producers here in the U.S. How important is it having data just like that from, from the U.S. Grains Council, from USMEF, uh, when, when you're face to face with these decision makers? Well, I think that's one of the things that Troy and I especially saw when we were overseas in, in the EU is that, you know, there's so much emotion driven um, policies and politics going on over there that we really need to just keep reminding ourselves that the more facts and figures and, and analytical data that we can give the policymakers, the better off that we're going to be. Um, and I think, you know, that's something that we also need to remember as producers, too. There's so many topics out there that are so emotionally driven. And I mean, I get into these constant debates all the time on social media that here's the facts. And unfortunately, sometimes we don't seem to want to listen to what the facts are, whether whether that's my opinion on a topic or not, this is just the facts. And so we need to make sure that we're constantly promoting not only the great things that our industry are doing, you know, our lifestyle, but also just giving those hard data numbers. I mean, that's going to be what keeps our industry in, the, in, any, in any great light, especially overseas. And especially it's a farm bill year, it's an election year. Uh, Troy, from, from uh, the, the times when you head to the, to the Beltway, uh, what's it like having this data and, and truly maybe seeing the look on a congressional office uh, staffer or a member's face when, when they hear the economic impact that grains and beef have in their districts? Oh, it's the impact that you see on their faces. Um, you know, whether it's from an ethanol standpoint, the beef, the overall consumption and production of agriculture, when you can present those numbers and like Alan said, on have it online, have it on your phone, have it brought up already, you can bring those numbers forward so fast. And, you know, from time to time we get busy, you know, we're, we have our seasons going to meetings, going back to the farm, but after a while you get those numbers uh, in your head, memorize the point where you can talk about it anywhere. If so, if you're, you know, many times when I fly out to Washington D.C., I and I won't say where, but I know where Senator Hickenlooper sits on the plane, and I will specifically get the seat across from him in the aisle. And we've had some great conversations. And, and he invited me when we we ran into each other one day, and he goes, "Anytime you want to visit with me, here's where I sit." And so I know that now, and I know on a Monday morning, chances are I'm going to be able to have a two hour conversation with them. And that's, that is almost more important than getting into the office, but uh, getting into those staff members uh, and un them understanding where we're coming from, because sometimes we'll meet with a staff member that's never been from our state. Yeah. And, you know, they're, they're like, Oh, I didn't understand that Colorado, Colorado number four has that much agriculture in it. I just thought we were more of an oil and gas camp, uh, district, and I'm like, no, we're one of the we're one of the strongest congressional districts for ag that there is, uh, especially in our state. It is the strongest, so that is important to have those figures in front of you. I can remember sitting in one representative's office, and the staff member said, "We don't have corn in our district," and I said, "The next time you fly in and out of DIA, look over that security fence." That's your district right there, and there is corn right up to the fence at DIA. 
Well, and again, it's just it's an education opportunity. And like you said, there's a lot of staffers that aren't from your respective states either. They're they're just doing their job and, and being able to have that short interaction is so vital. And Ellen, you're out in, in, in D.C. Uh, maybe share how important it is to to have these facts and be concise when you're sitting down, because, again, unless you've been up to the hill and done a fly-in or, or had that engagement, it's so much different than having a face-to-face -face meeting at a field day back in the home state. Yeah, I would say uh, regardless of what conversation you're entering, kind of having this information is really, really helpful. I will share the U.S. Grains Council uh, doesn't lobby, so we are we do not have to go on the Hill, and that's why we, we partner so closely with uh, NCGA and our other, um, you know, lobbying partners, uh, association partners, I would say the other great use for these uh, kind of like studies and, and these quick fast facts that are really, really impactful is with the fellow farmers in the countryside uh, and the work to kind of demonstrate the work that your trade association, the Grains Council uh, is doing on behalf of, of farmers to, to show kind of um, the sellback on checkoff investments, on membership and, and that sort of thing, I think is another great way to, to really use these uh, studies. Now, also, when we're talking about just being face to face, using important information like this, um, obviously, uh, both Troy and Jacqueline have mentioned just uh, their work in, outside of the United States. And you both mentioned uh, work being in the EU and in that part of the world. Uh, could you maybe share just a little more on that collaboration platform on agriculture and, and what that's also doing to, to really uh, be a voice and educational opportunity to grow these markets on, on the global scale? Yeah, I can go ahead and take a swing at that. Um, it's a two-year program every other year. Uh, this year it was in the United States, the USDA hosted. So the collaboration platform on agriculture is a conversation in between between the United States Department of Ag, its counterpart, DG Agri, over in the European Union. And, you know, Jacqueline wasn't able to attend this year, but uh, uh, Kim attended. And I know Lane, uh, there were other NCBA officials there. We had Tom Haig, our chairman of NCGA, uh, he attended. And it was one of those conversations that what is going on over in the European Union? We've watched the elections. We've watched the protests. Uh, when we were over there in December of 22, we were able to meet with some farmers um, at the EU Parliament that day. And they're like, we don't want to force our, the policies that we're having forced on us upon you, but it's the only fair way to do this. But can you help us get us out of these policies, you know, talk into the EU parliament and help them understand that what they're doing with some of their ideas on the, the green deal and the farm to fork, we're going to be detrimental and we can't all just change our diet. We, this, this world works in a certain way. And when Jack and I were over there, I, I wondered how long would, would it take for us to see the European Union mentality, some of those radical ideas wash up on our shores. I didn't understand and I didn't anticipate that it wouldn't be on our shores, that it would roll up onto the shores of Mexico and then all of a sudden we would have a GMO ban on corn. And it's those those ideas that we have to, com we have to compete against those ideas. And we have to, like Jacqueline said, put the facts out there, take the emotion out of it, use the science, and move forward on it. And, and you mentioned those ideological policy decisions like in Mexico, and we look at the situation now where their drought is so extreme. Um, I, I don't have the figure off the top of my head, but they are importing a lot of corn, and obviously that's that's on the feed end of things, but uh, when, when ideology comes into the policy-making decision instead of science and facts, that, that is concerning. And as you said, it came to the shores of Mexico, employees of the United States, but that, no doubt, there will be introduced legislation or, or agency rules that come from uh, uh, European or other nations that uh, don't quite understand it. Um, soliloquy set aside, Jacqueline, your, your perspective on things. 
Yeah, I mean, Atari hit it right on the head on that one. You know, I, it's it's so important to be engaged in those conversations, especially internationally. But at the same time, it's also important to take what we've learned when we've been overseas and bring it back to the producers in the U.S. and say, this is what's going on. We don't want to be like this. What do we need to do to make sure that we're not going to become like this? And, you know, I was in Brazil in March down there, and it was amazing to me um, just the amount of, of, of facts and figures that I was giving that that really overcame like all that misinformation that I had followed in the media and it completely changed my opinion on Brazilian agriculture and that's one of those things too you know you need to come back and tell those stories with other producers and and say hey if we don't give our act together here and start compromising on some things Brazil's gonna completely pass us up and and we're just gonna be in the tail lights on that one and so I think it's important, you know, to be engaged not only with the policymakers, but I, one of the things that I noticed when we were, especially in the EU, is the producers just sometimes don't know how to tell their story or get their point across. And, and so there's those so many great opportunities out there to work with the different groups in industry, whether it's your state cattle association or the national associations, both corn growers or NCBA, you know, to learn how to develop that story and to get that point across. Because if you don't have the right way to get a story across, it's going to be completely ineffective and it's, it's going to do more harm than good. And so we need to make sure that we're able to pre present a real cohesive front and, and work together on these, especially with people like the, the corn growers and, and U.S. Grains Council and, and show that we're, we're a solid front and, and we're all telling the same story. And, and that's what's really important at the end of the day. Now, I know you both have been asked from folks back home, your, your fellow uh, peers in the industry, why, why, why do we need these export markets? I, I know we talked about the figures already, but I, uh, folks uh, sit down at the coffee shop maybe or the local livestock yards. Why are we exporting our beef when we're importing beef? Why are we exporting our corn, our wheat, all of our grains? What, what, what is that conversation like? Troy, I'll, I'll start with you. Uh, obviously you have grains and, and cattle as well, but what, utilizing the facts and the figures, what, what are those conversations like with folks that just are, don't maybe understand why we are exporting U.S. ag products? The number I normally start with in that conversation is 95%. 95% of the world's population lives outside of our borders. So if we want to, if we want to just look inward, that's fine. But going back to that comment I made earlier, we want, how many neighbors do we lose at that point? Because, you know, you look at corn and, and Jacqueline can help me with the beef. But if you look at corn, we export uh, about eight uh, a year ago is about 17 percent. I think, Ellen, in grain form of uh, the, the U.S. corn crop, it, it floats a little bit. It, it was down this last year or two. But historically, that's about where we're at. OK, you take the keep going in the that kernel of corn and dividing it out about 35 36 percent is consumed by livestock now that's beef pork poultry a certain percent of that is exported so yeah we say we export 15 16 percent but those exports grow exponentially when you add in what we're exporting in protein then you throw in ethanol and ddgs on top of that where allen and u.s grains council comes in and those numbers get bigger. So that 15% of our kernel of corn that gets exported is much more than that when it's all said and done. And when it comes down to it, we, we're we feeding the world. No one else can do it. Brazil wants to do it. But when it comes to beef, there's nobody that does it better than us. You take what Jacqueline said about the sand hills of Nebraska. You, there's a reason we can take that ruminant animal turn that grass that's inedible for other things, put some corn into them at the feedlot, and we've got the best product out there. No one can compete against us. And, and Jacqueline, same area. Why, why are we exporting our beef and why are we importing some beef at the same time? I, I know that's a question you probably get asked quite a bit. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, it's surprising how, how that question really stirs people up, you know, in conversation. Uh, you know, and we're looking at I think the facts are right now we're, we're sending about 14 percent of our beef overseas um it's equivalent to just a shy of 10 billion dollars worth of product but it's product that we really don't utilize here in the u.s 
you know, things like tripe and tongue and hearts and kidneys and liver and, and, and those that aren't, aren't really on the, aren't really on our dining plate. Well, at least in my household, you know, in the evening time. And I think that's one of those things that we forget is we really, in order to add value to that carcass, we really need to utilize it as much as we possibly can. And in, in retrospect, then we also, I mean, you export beef, you also import beef. And the reason being is because of our feeding system here in the U S you know, we need that lean trim. We send a lot of cattle that have a lot of fat on them into the marketplace and, and we all love our ground beef and, and it's tough to get as much ground beef as we'd be able to get if we didn't get some of that lean trim coming in from other countries. Now, not to justify the fact that we need to make sure that all beef that's still coming into the U.S. still passes our jurisdiction of what we classify as safe, wholesome processing, you know, packaging and, and export in, in terms of getting it into the U.S. So I we saw this you know, last year with Paraguay, there's still that controversy of should we be letting product in from Paraguay? I, I do not think at this time that we should be until we can we can guarantee that a lot of their parameters are equivalent with ours here in the U.S. And, and also we need to be cognizant of an of it at a disease level, too. You know, we need to be conscientious of things like FMD and whatnot. And I think that's one of the things, you know, um, export and import markets are great, but as long as they don't hurt the entire industry as a whole in whatever country you're dealing with, I think that's the, that's the most important fact at the end of the day. And Ellen, from your perspective, when, when you're promoting um, uh, uh, U.S. grains and, and expanding these export markets, how important is it for, again, we, we talked about these educational materials uh, that, that all the studies that, uh, that producers can utilize in, in, in beefing up their uh, uh, elevator talks and just having that scientific uh, information as well, but the importance of just being engaged and the collaboration, again, with, with, the, with NCBA, with the National Corn Grovers. Uh, let's maybe talk about just, uh, again, that collaboration and maybe some of the opportunities that there are out there for continued education within these uh, respective organizations. Yeah, so that engagement piece is, is critical. And, you know, we have several programs uh, around the world that it, are in collaboration with these partners that we're talking about. Um, and being able to talk to uh, a cattle farmer, a corn farmer, uh, really makes a world of difference for a customer um, in, in Southeast Asia, in, in Africa somewhere, knowing who that who the producer is uh, really does um, change the perspective. Um, you know, we have conversations all of the time. Jacqueline brought it up earlier uh, with the concerns of, you know, factory farming, the, these big scary terms that you hear. And when you put a face to those production practices, when you have someone you can, uh, like Jacqueline mentioned, show pictures of, of those operations and really just have a conversation, um, it, it changes it changes their world, their perspective of, of what could be, and and um, also gives them someone that they can reach out to with more questions. And and so that's really the whole point of the U.S. Grains Council is we talk about um, our currency is relationships and information. And so being able to make those connections with farmers, um, with other agribusinesses, with USMEF, with NCBA, whoever it may be, uh, so we can continue to promote U.S. products um, is really what it's all about. Now, also, when we look at maybe those educational opportunities, I do see that there's an upcoming trade summit event along with trade school partnerships between uh, the respective organizations. Uh, what can our listeners do to maybe learn more about this or engage or, or work with uh, with their associations to maybe uh, become a, a better advocate for, for trade? Yeah, so our trade schools, um, trade policy academies and trade summits, uh, we do in collaboration always with the uh, National Corn Growers Association and we're working on making that a larger collaboration because like we've been talking about here on the podcast, um, trade is a bigger picture um, conversation and so the more groups we can pull into, um, the the better that conversation becomes and, and the bigger picture that our farmers can, can really understand. And so so, um, we have that information again on grains.org, why trade matters. Uh, we always put the information there and then NCGA puts out that information as well. And, and Troy, from your perspective as a volunteer leader, uh, what, what do you, what do you tell that next generation of, of leaders about the importance of, of, uh, 
maybe telling mom and dad it's okay to 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 let the the next generation go and participate and and, and grow the family biz, business as uh, footprint on a global scale and, and and let them take a little break away from the operation to to advocate and educate. Well, it's simply this the the success we enjoy today was put forward the work was done by somebody 15 20 years ago um so what the work i do today is it going to benefit me or is it going to benefit somebody down the line in a few years and as far as that education piece and i i try and work this in about everywhere i go and i know michael is probably back listening and going to shake his head but if you don't have a chance to return to the farm and and or the ranch and you want to be involved in agriculture look at working for an ncga and ncba us grains usmef those are some excellent opportunities to ex still be involved in agriculture and help others and you know it uh jacqueline mentioned earlier being able to tell our story overseas i think we'd all be remiss if we didn't say a huge thank you to um not only 4-H leaders, FFA advisors, they're the ones who get us to that line, to that podium to tell those stories. Right now, as Jacqueline mentioned, there's not a lot of focus on new trade agreements or, or free trade agreements to be to be precise. Uh, how important is it though for, for this, uh, for the farmers and ranchers tuning in today to really be engaged uh, not only with uh, folks on uh, from their respective districts but truly those agencies as well just the impact that trade has on u.s agriculture jacqueline uh, do, you, do you want to take that one first sure i sure can i you know i i don't think we i think we continue to underestimate how important trade is and i think that's sometimes because we forget to look past our our county lines or sometimes our state lines and see that there's a whole other world out there that we're very dependent on on each other and we're all interconnected somehow and i think that's one of the things i always try to preach especially when i'm overseas is we're as dependent on you as you're dependent on us and and you know it doesn't matter if you're on a trade mission in colombia or the eu or brazil or ireland or wherever we have a lot of the similar issues and and so being able to to share those issues and those stories and and that collaboration between each other only makes the industry stronger and and the stronger we are as an industry that gives us more resources to combat those that are anti-ag and anti-beef and still think for some reason that all their groceries come from a grocery store and and forget that the policies that they make in dc affect us in our in our operations whether it be in colorado nebraska or even on the suburbs of washington dc and I think that's something that we continue to forget. Now, I do want to I do want to backtrack just a bit on the question you asked Troy. You know, that's that's been a, a topic of contention sometimes over the years in our in our operation is is me being gone on these trade missions or traveling overseas. And I remember the first couple trips I took, my parents weren't very happy with that. And now my dad will call me every single day when I'm gone and he wants to know everything that I learned that day. And and he is as informed and as knowledgeable on that as as i as i try to be you know just for the fact that he sees that big picture and he understands not only not only the effect that it has overseas but also the effect it has here just just within our own operation i mean we we developed a product line called enviro smart beef based off of things that we had seen in the eu that was happening and so i mean it's just those it's those lessons and education that you can bring back home and share that are priceless and not only to the operation and the legacy that we hope to leave, but also with what we can share to other producers. Yep. I'll, I'll just follow up on that, that I think the importance uh, of trade um, is is not only to, um, you know, the country's economy that you're doing trade with. We've already talked about the, that value of trade to the state. And now Jacqueline's talking about that individual piece of the importance of trade. Um, and I think that is really, you know, Troy mentioned our, our mission statement about improving lives and trade really does um, impact individuals. And so, uh, you know, agriculture, is, we feed and fuel the world and, and that only happens when trade works. And, and that is kind of the, the key here to, to kind of the, the whole thing we're talking about is 
how can we make a bigger impact? And uh, we've shared a lot of really important pieces to that. You know, our customers are outside of the U.S. at this point. And so how can we continue to get market access? Uh, how do we develop those long term customers um, in countries and continue to develop those pipelines of um, long term profitability for farmers uh, here in the U.S.? And so I think that improving lives piece uh, can't be overlooked or, or understated enough um, because it really does make a difference to um, kind of the country perspective all the way down to the individuals. Now, obviously, um, yeah, there's something called a farm bill that's been talked about here as of <laughs> everybody's uh, chuckling over that one. Obviously, we got pretty excited a few weeks ago when the House moved forward with their farm bill. A lot of uncertainty surrounding the fate of a possible 2024 farm bill and a possible extension come this fall after the uh, previous extension expires at the end of September of the 2018 Farm Bill. But uh, there are uh, important programs in there to increase trade. Now, now we have, there's a good FMD and there's a bad FMD. So uh, there's a foot and mouth disease. We're not covering that. That's the bad FMD. But there's the other acronym that USDA uses, that Foreign Market Development Program and, and Market Access Program, or MAP. Um, Again, the, these are important uh, uh, dollar amounts that truly bring money back in to our rural communities and into the U.S. So it's not just uh, 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 dollars being put forward for folks to go on a junket. It truly is about creating more opportunities, bringing those dollars back to our local communities. So, um, Troy, from your perspective, how, how important is it that we have funding and uh, for MAP and, and FMD foreign market development that is and, and and for foreign market or for foreign uh animal diseases as well so, such as foot and mouth disease that's a totally separate issue that could impact our our trade but how important are these programs when you're uh uh, uh going out on the road but also discussing these with those decision makers out in our nation's capital it's twofold um, when you look at foreign market development market access and yes, when doing an interview with the cattle industry, you do not just come out and say, we need an increase in FMD. It, <laughs> you'll get a strange look from Kevin Oxner on TV really quick when you're doing an interview. But those numbers, and Ellen can back me up on that, those numbers have not increased since 2006, I believe, roughly. Wow. So when you figure inflation in, those numbers, the funding from a farm bill has actually went down. Plus it's been, um, oh, there's a fancy term for the, the cutting of it when they they bring it in when we're, when we're uh, working through the farm bill. Those numbers have went down. So it is awfully important, this farm bill, to get those numbers up, not just for corn growers, but for cattle producers, for all of us in agriculture, the industry, as I would call it, because we we don't make up a very big number of people but they're important and our representatives back in washington dc more and more often are further and further removed from the farm so uh, for them to understand what foreign market development and market access is is critical um, the second part of that is when we talk to our legislators back in dc i think it's interesting to ask them and their staff members when's the last free trade agreement. When was it signed? And when you go back to, I believe, 2006, 2007, and I believe we go to Columbia with it, uh, it was at, right at the end of the Bush administration, beginning of Obama. So we can take our political hat off, whether we're red or blue. Either party has dropped the ball. And I'm just going to say it. They, our government has dropped the ball over the last 15 plus years in keeping up. Other countries have led the way getting into those markets. And so we don't want to be left behind. We're seeing what Brazil is doing to, to the corn industry, soybean industry when it comes to China, some of our overseas markets, filling, you know, sub Russia filling gaps in wheat that uh, maybe we should be looking at. There's just an awful important factor there that we haven't been at the table updating those free trade agreements since in quite a few administrations. 
Yeah, to add just a little bit of context to that, Troy is exactly right. We would need more than a 50% increase um, in the MAP and FMD spending to get back to that 2006 spending level, which also goes to, to speak to that uh, importance of collaboration in our programs, because we want to be really wise with those dollars that we do have. So when we partner on buyers and seller conferences with USMEF and, and USEC and that sort of thing, that is being really wise with the dollars that we do have and so that collaboration piece is really important for us the other thing i'll touch on is those free trade agreements so we only have about 20 here uh, in the u.s free trade agreements and there's more than 460 worldwide um, and so we are certainly missing out um, on those free trade agreement pieces the other thing to look at is more than 50 percent of our exports come from our free trade agreements so they definitely work. And so the more free trade agreements we have, uh, the better off we are to, to making successful um, trades. And, and that market access piece is really important. Jacqueline, do you want to weigh in on that? No, I, I very much agree with everything that uh, both Troy and Ellen have said. And I think that's one of the things that we need to always keep in the back of our mind that we can go a lot further with our dollars if we do collaborate. You know, yep. we're representing multiple industries at one time, and, and, and I think that's the way to be definitely very fraudulent in our spending and, and be conscientious of, of what we're presenting in our picture. But, I mean, I, I've sat, you know, I've, I've been been in one of those um, culinary demonstrations in Colombia that USMEF was leading, and, and, you know, and you see what they're doing in terms of market development overseas, and it, it blows your mind. And I was I had a translator that was next to me and I asked if they would translate everything that the that the chef was speaking and he couldn't have told my story any better than I could have and that was so encouraging to me and and it's like I there's definitely a need a need for that and a need to continue to increase that funding. What, was that my translator that I use when I go to South America? Was it Weston? No, it wasn't. But Weston was down there because he had the only cowboy hat there at the trade show, so he he stuck out like a sore thumb. But boy, they they would all flock to him for sure. Our, our, our trade liaison for the Montana Department of Agriculture is in high demand in South America because he speaks fluent Spanish and ranches as well. Uh, our good friend Weston Merrill ha had to ask because he, he's a good friend of mine. But hey, I, I know we have a busy day, whether it's on our operations, out in the Beltway. Um, what, are, what are some just last thoughts that the three of you have when it comes to driving demand for sustainable, high quality, safe American beef and grain products? in utilizing promotion opportunities and funding to really uh, get these markets, uh, get as much of our U.S. product in front of these consumers on the global scale as possible. Troy, I'll start with you. Okay. Um, I think it's it, the most important fact in my mind is just continuing that planting of the seed, nurturing the, tr the, the product that we have there because we keep to, tomorrow's markets are started today or they were started yesterday and we need to build upon that we have to keep going forward on it um, you know I, I go back to the end of J June that USDA report when it came out and I got to see corn go down 15 cents in one day that was that rattled a few um, few cases uh, financial cases in my mind and we need to be able to counter that with positive news on market exports, uh, growth, not only foreign, but domestically as well. But when we're talking foreign markets today, um, and that population is outside of our, our borders, that is awfully important. If we wanna be a competitive market, we have to take our product across the seas. And you know, some of the listeners may be sitting here going, but wait a minute, the more grain U.S. Grains Council exports, that hurts me in the, on, you know, no, it, it all works out. And it, you know, I see the poultry industry over in our poultry milling training center over in Tunis with U.S. Grains Council, how that has improved lives over there, that they're more efficient with their grain and they are learning good techniques from our, our dollars here. And that's improving their lives. And as they improve their lives, they want that higher protein. And it moves up the, the food chain, literally. And that is awfully important to me. And I think it should be important to every producer out there. 
you know, Troy hit it right on the head with that win. And I, and I mean, and we've got to, I, I see it time and time again, just within our own industry here in the U.S. You know, we have a tendency to circle our wagons and start shooting inwards on each other. And in order for us to continue to have successful operations, we really need to be looking outside our country borders. And I think those are, like I've said earlier, you know, the, the sky's the limit in, in terms of potential for growth and those opportunities. And, you know, when, when we are kind of get, might get into a funding crisis, those collaborations are so important, um, whether it be for trade missions or market development, or even having that opportunity to send people overseas that come back and tell their stories of everything they experienced. I mean, when I, when I talk to people, you know, and they specifically ask about the packing industry, you know, I've been to packing plants on six continents. That's something I'm very, very proud of because I learned something from every educational opportunity I've been given, been able to come home and share that with producers here. And sometimes I think it's important to tell people that maybe we're not as great as we think we are. You know, there's, there's a lot of technology develop and a lot of great production development that's happening in other countries that if we don't stop fighting within our own country, we're going to get passed up. And, and that probably scares me more than anything. It's just like, stop the critics, stop the fighting and infighting amongst our industries and, and really work on developing this product development because we have great products. Corn and beef are amazing, you know, so let's share it with the world. But we have to come together in order to be able to do that. Ellen, last thoughts? Yeah, I think Troy and Jacqueline summarized really beautifully. I I think it all comes back for me to, to move that grain uh, anywhere, anyhow. And that happens through good trade policy, collaboration, and market access. And that's important because of the impact um, of, of improving lives and, and the impact to individuals too. And, and that's exactly what Troy and Jacqueline said. And that's why our organizations exist and, and why we collaborate with each other too. Well, again, to have a successful future for farmers and ranchers and the products that uh, that we grow to feed and clothe the world, that collaboration is key and in, in creating those global opportunities is a key part of that foundation as well. So again, thank you to Troy, Jacqueline and Ellen for joining us here today. And there's so many more resources and conversations around topics just like this, whether it's on Cattlemen to Cattlemen, here on the Cattlemen's Call uh, podcast, uh, just check out ncba.org or the respective websites of our guests here today as well. So thank you, uh, you three for joining us here today. Thank you very much. Thanks, Lane. Well, with that, friends, we appreciate you joining us for this uh, great conversation about collaboration. And again, it was brought to you by our friends at the National Corn Growers Association. I hope your summer is going well, friends. Stay safe out there and hopefully you can get a hay crop up like I'm trying to do, but it's raining. Uh, last I'll say about that here today. Friends, we look forward to uh, having you join us again. If you haven't done so, subscribe to the Cattleman's Call podcast. I'm Lane Northland. We'll catch you next time. Thanks for tuning in to NCBA's Cattleman's Call podcast with Lane Nordland. For more information, visit ncba.org and make sure to subscribe to the podcast today.